Welcome to the Allied Health Financial Podcast, evidence-based finance education for allied health professionals. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Allied Health Financial Podcast. My name is Jack Mo, and as always, I have my friend Ryan with me. How's it going, Ryan? Things are doing great. How are you? I'm I'm pretty excited. We're extremely lucky to have a bona fide personal finance celebrity with us today. She's the author of the Feel Good Personal Finance book, Happy Go Money, the resident financial expert on CTV's The Social, and the host of the RBC Money Moves podcast. She's written for major newspapers across the country, including the Financial Post and the Globe and Mail. And most recently, she's appeared on the Drew Barrymore Show, which now basically puts us in the same tier as national daytime television. So please welcome Melissa Leong. Thanks for joining us today, Melissa. Thank you so much for having me, gentlemen. I uh, a bona fide, you know, is that it's a special tier. It sounds it sounds like it's um, a bona fide celebrity is is something else, right? <laughs> it's, it's 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 a whole level above the verified check mark on any social media. It's it's way above that. Yes, there's a you know there's a panel of judges who determines who fall <laughs> into this very elite category. Thank you for um, for the lovely and generous introduction. Well, thank you for for taking your time to be with us today. So your path to becoming a personal finance expert and writing Happy Go Money is a really fascinating one. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about how you got into the personal finance world? Mm -hmm. I was the personal finance reporter for the Financial Post for, I think, almost, oh, I don't even know, almost 10 years? I know that's not possible because I'm so young. How? <laughs> but yes, I, I was a, a newspaper reporter for about 17 years, and that included time in the business section where I had the honor of being able to tell stories about people's lives, which happened to be around money. That's essentially what personal finance is. It's basically the story of our lives, the story of birth and death and everything in between, weddings, new homes. And that's been a tremendous gift to me to be able to connect with so many people and to be able to help people in something that I truly believe will make you happier, will give your life meaning if you know how to manage your money. We absolutely love your book because it's such a refreshing take on personal finance. We've read quite a few of the personal finance books out there. And this is the first one that makes positive psychology and behavioral economics kind of the stars of the show. We also prod ourselves quite a bit in talking about evidence-based finance. So the amount of research and the science, the neuroscience you bring is absolutely amazing. You talk a lot in your book about the research surrounding income and its correlation with life satisfaction. What does that research say? Thank you for touching on all of those things, because I think you cannot launch into a discussion about how people should manage their money without first bringing up some very important points surrounding, well, what is your money for? Why are you busting your butt to make this money, to get that raise, to buy that house, to live in this certain neighborhood? Why are you doing that? So let's have a discussion around it. You know, I, I think people would say, well, I'm doing it because I want to be happier. I need more money to be happier. If only I had this amount of money, I would be you know, a perfect 10 on the happiness scale. And that's not what the science says. And people have been looking for this magic number. And a lot of researchers have come up with these so-called magic numbers for people. That usually falls between, I think it's sixty dollars to $75,000 US per single family household pre-tax. That's the amount of money you generally need to make to be happy on a day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, on a day-to-day -day uh, level. So basically how you feel right now listening to this podcast, how you felt yesterday, how you'll feel tomorrow. When it comes to a judgment about your life, basically a, a discussion of life satisfaction in general, then that figure, according to research, is closer to $90,000 US. Of course, that is an average. And so you could make far less and still be perfectly happy or far more and be happy and the interesting thing is that if you make more money above these thresholds, it is actually associated with a decrease in happiness, which is so bizarre. <laughs> I think people think, why would I be more unhappy if I make more money? Yeah. And right after we finished the chapter in that book, we polled our listeners on Instagram and we asked them what they thought about. And I think we used the, the 90-ish thousand dollar number. 
And we asked them, you know, did you think that, do you think this is true that, you know, this is the, the number that you need for, for life satisfaction? And the answer was a resounding no. I think we got like single digit percentages of someone who said yes. And I wonder to myself, is that maybe because most of our members are in larger Canadian markets like, you know, Toronto and Vancouver? Now, do you think that the higher cost of living in these areas maybe it, like affects the perception of, of this amount of money being enough for people to live? Oh, absolutely. It depends on where you live, what the standard of living is, what the job opportunities in your space are. I mean, the number is not important. I think we get fixated on these numbers of this is the optimal amount of money to make. But it's actually not about that. What the research is showing and is trying, the point of it is to illustrate that once you make a certain amount of money, any more money above that threshold, whether that be 90, 100, you know, 120, 150, whatever it is, it doesn't actually make you more happy. The reason why is because you are, you need to live. <laughs> you need to be able to not worry about debt creditors. You need to be able to cover your basis and eat and sleep indoors. But once your basic needs are met, there is interesting research that shows that there is actually a decrease in happiness because you are focused on other things. Your focus may be on work, which is more stressful. It maybe means that you are spending less time at home and less time with your family, which makes you more happy. The more things you accumulate, you focus more on material goods, which makes people more unhappy. Or you're keeping up with the Joneses, or you are starting to lose appreciation for the little things in life which you cannot underestimate how much joy you can get from things that are almost free. That's really interesting. So if money does have a diminishing rate of return when it comes to happiness and can even lower our overall life satisfaction, what can we do with our money to help make us happier? So obviously we're all different. So I can't tell you, you know, I can't tell you guys what you should or should not buy because obviously you might say to me, listen, Melissa, this thing that I bought, this watch, this coat, this car, whatever it is, it, it gives me infinite joy, okay? But I can just tell you what the research says. So according to science, there are a number of things that you can spend your money on in order to be happier. One of those things is experiences. Experiences bond you to other people. They give you more bang for your buck than material goods because you enjoy them with other individuals as well you have the memory of it, you know, you, it, it creates goodwill. And then you basically talk about what happens in Vegas, stays in, Ve in Vegas, but you'll have the memories of this wonderful thing that you did, or you've learned a new skill, or you have, you know, you've learned new ways to experience joy that will continue to pay dividends down the road. The other thing is others. So spending your money on other people that could look like charity. I mean, whether you're rich, whether you're poor worldwide surveys show that if you donated to other people, if you spend on other people, you feel not only richer, but you feel more satisfied with life. And so you could make a point of being more deliberate with how you spend when it comes to charity or giving to other people, your friends, your family, time savers, people who value time over money are happier and people who choose to value time over money are happier. And so that can take many forms. You know, that can take the form of, hey, mom, stop driving around to look for, you know, gas that's two cents cheaper because you need to put a value on your time as well as should you take that job that pays you slightly more, but the commute is longer then you might actually have to work longer hours. You know, you have to weigh many things, not just the dollar figure of how much you're going to make. And so those three things are some things that you can do right away that, according to research, is it's supposed to give you a bigger boost. And I mean, there are some other things which I'm sure that your audiences would appreciate, like health, spending your money on health, spending your money on things that would change your physical health, your mental health. Those are so important. And sometimes we get distracted from doing that, or we are reluctant to spend on certain things that have to do with, you know, overall health, which I find fascinating. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I didn't read your book. I listened to it. I listened to the audiobook. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're enjoying this and you like audiobooks, go buy it in audiobook format because it's it's honestly, Melissa, like you're just talking to someone, just like having a general conversation. It's one of the best audiobooks I've read. And yes, I know it's an audiobook about personal finance, which a lot of people are like, how could that be interesting? But you did an amazing <laughs> job. That was It was really great. Oh, thank you. I was so pregnant when I uh, did that audiobook. And I, w I remember sitting in the studio for you know, nine hours a day. And I think I was like almost nine months pregnant, very uncomfortable to sit for that long. But it, it was a joy. I do really feel like when I talk about money that I'm just I'm really talking about our lives and the lives that we want to create for ourselves. 
Well, you can tell you were glowing while you were reading the right, reading the book. I can tell you that. <laughs> yes, glowing and, and holding my pee basically for hours because I always had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I was driving to work from the house that we just purchased. That was like a I was I had a five minute walk to work, and now it's a it's a thirty minute drive to work. And I was like, oh man, what did I just do? And I read the whole commuting part, but it was you know backyard and room for a baby. You know, um, but it was it was a tough realization to get into in the car at that point. It doesn't mean that you're going to always make perfect decisions. It's just a discussion. It's just a another voice that you add in your mind when you weigh whether or not to spend your resources on something. No, that definitely makes sense. And although the book, like we said, has a large focus on psychology and behavioral finance, you also give a lot of concrete, practical information on how to get started on the path to financial happiness. And we know you don't like the B word. We feel the same way. We call ours the financial planner. But many people think that using a budget will lower their happiness. But in, in the book, you make a great counter argument for that. So how can having a spending plan help with money happiness? So I have never been someone who counted every pack of gum or every purchase I made. I'm just, I, I can't. I am overwhelmed. I have small children. They are feral. And if I had to stop and try to contemplate the long-term implications of me buying this, you know, takeout food, I would be so stressed. You know, I'd also make the wrong decision because I'm tired and I don't want to cook. So I think that it's important for people to look back at the last, maybe say three months of their spending at times when they feel out of control, especially now during the pandemic, when so much of our behavior has possibly been out of the ordinary or you've been making decisions under duress. We have been stressed and your brain does not function optimally when you are stressed. That means you're not making normal, rational money decisions. And that's, I'm not saying that that's your fault because we're all in this. And even I have fallen victim to retail therapy, even though I wrote a book on it. <laughs> but, you know, I think that if you have felt out of control, it's important to sit down and look at the inflow and outflow of your money. And that might look like creating a budget. It's just understanding what's happening and getting clarity. And once you figure that out, you know, different people do different things. Some people actually like to draw a flow chart so they see the inflow of their money, especially if their money is quite automated. And so you don't always keep track of where everything goes. But, you know, you might create a budget and realize, okay, these are my priorities. I'm going to siphon money out and it's going to go automatically to retirement, automatically going to go to a separate account that is going to be a, a risk fund, which means this is what I'm going to use to grow my business, to take chances, to put more into marketing, to put whatever it is. You might have something for a kid's education. And then you're also going to determine this is how much I need for fun. And it's going to go automatically into an account that is associated with a debit card. And if there's money in there, guys, we're going for coffee and it's on me. I'm going to spend it if it's already in there because I've already said it's okay to spend. And I've also set aside money for my goals. So I know I've already taken care of the things that are important to me. So if I want to buy blank, then hell yes, I am buying this thing. It's almost like being on a diet that's a little bit too strict. At some point, if you cut out absolutely everything you love, your body's just going to want to rebound the same thing. Now, our other favorite financial tool, and we know it's one of yours too, and we know our listeners are going to lean back and groan, but it's the emergency fund. In Happy Go Money, you talk very openly about the importance of having a healthy emergency fund. And in the Money Moves podcast, you mentioned how you used some of your savings to put extra money into the market when it dipped at the start of the pandemic. And we have been definitely big advocates of this. So Jack and I had both hands in the air cheering when we listened to that part of the podcast. Saving is hard. Many of us don't equate making the sacrifices required to save with happiness. So how do savings like an emergency fund contribute to our overall financial happiness? Emergency funds are not sexy. Okay, no one is going to say, man, I need to save my money in case I break my hip or something and can't work. Like <laughs> That is not... You know, it doesn't seem like something that would make you happy to think about, but I can promise you that if you had money set aside in a, you know, easily accessible place, maybe a high interest savings account, that when, can I swear? I'm not going to swear. When crap hit the fan, you're going to be so grateful that that money is, is there. And I 
always say that you have to make choices now. You have to set up your money in a way that will give you choices and opportunities in the future. You know, for example, if you take on debt today, what you're essentially doing is you're asking your future self to sacrifice. And the same thing when you don't think about putting some money aside for the so-called emergencies. I know that sounds like I'm a money expert and I'm just sort of preaching with my finger in your face, but you know, my emergency fund has rescued me time and time again. You know, I set up my life in a way just because I was trying to be prudent. And also because I, when I was getting married, I, I married the happiest man in Canada. I thought life was going to be great. I thought we were going to, you know, start planning to have kids right away. And he became very ill. He was terrorized by suicidal ideation and depression and anxiety very suddenly a few months after we got married. And if we didn't have an emergency fund, I mean, money wouldn't have made that time better, but not having that money would have made that time so much worse. We had that so that we could focus on his healing. You know, we originally had that in case, you know, I thought, well, what if I don't work and I stay at home? Or what if he stays at home with the kids? We should probably need a cushion in case something happens. And that actually ended up being money for something else. You know, he had money for treatment. We didn't worry about paying bills because he because he is self-employed and um, he he couldn't work for a time. And that lesson, it's funny, Happy Go Money ended up being this survival guide that I thought I was writing for other people, but it was a survival guide that I needed again that I would turn to again, all of those things that I had written, I was actually writing for myself because when I was expecting my second child, you know, four years later, he became sick again. And that emergency fund helped us. I, uh, you know, when I lost my job and my emergency fund rescued me. And then when the pandemic came and all of my work dried up and my husband's work dried up and we were in the kitchen this one day when everything was shut down and we thought, oh my goodness, what, what? what are we going to do? We have zero income. We took out our calculators and our spreadsheets and we were again so grateful that we had an emergency fund and enough of an emergency fund because of my past lessons to carry us through a year. So we had a year's worth of living expenses so that no matter how long this pandemic would last, we could take care of our family. And it ended up that we actually were able to pivot, pivot and find some work and, and the numbers worked out. And then so we were extra grateful that we had money to actually invest when the stock market crashed. Yeah, I mean, it sounds just reason after reason that emergency funds are, you know, you're right, they're not sexy. And I think someone needs to make, we might end up making an emergency funds aren't sexy t-shirt <laughs> and selling it on the website because I think that that needs to be out there. But I think even though they're not sexy, they're, they're super important. Yeah, we really appreciate you sharing that with our listeners. Now, to finish off the podcast, we've got a, a surprise bonus question for you if you're game. Oh, is it personal? Like, am I going to have to reveal my deep, dark secrets? Not quite. Almost, but not quite. Okay. Okay. I'm pretty open. I mean, <laughs> I put it all in the book, so fire away. So because we knew we were talking to an author and journalist, we, we did our best to, you know, to make sure we prepare and we did our research. So. In that process, we found out that Happy Go Money isn't your only book. You've also authored a series of young adult fiction novels about vampires called What Kills Me. So <laughs> if the main character of that series, Z, came oh to you for goodness. some investment advice, what would you tell her? I would tell her that you're a vampire, you're going to live forever, and that means you need a lot of money. And I would say that because you're going to live forever, I think you have to decide the life that you want to live and then allocate your resources to that. I think sometimes we do the opposite, actually. I think we spend our money on things trying to build something, build ourselves up. You know, if we have this home, it will mean this. If I buy this jacket to go into this job interview, it will make me feel more confident. But it's actually backwards. You know, it should be, how do I use my resources to build confidence? How do I use my resources to actually fulfill me? What do I value? If I value my family, then I probably should be spending my money on things that bring me closer to my family and not, you know, blank. That really is just I'm buying on a whim because it's two in the morning and I have my phone and I'm buying something with a one click buy button. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. And that's that's how you that's when you get the bona fide personal finance celebrity, when you can spin a question like that into like legitimate financial advice. That's, <laughs> that's a mic drop right there. That's perfect. 
that's also life advice at the same time. Exactly. Life forever. <laughs> Melissa, thank you so, so much for coming onto the podcast with us. It's been an absolute pleasure for Jacqueline and I and a treat for our listeners for you to almost talk kind of directly to them. Where can some of our members find you? So I suck at a lot of social media, but I am most active on Instagram with the... Um, under the name Liz Leong. And so if you find me there, that's where I'm, I'm always happy to connect with people. And uh, if you just want to find out just more information or about my book, then you can visit melissaleong.com. Perfect. And we'll, we'll link to all those things in the show notes so that if you're listening to the podcast, and you want to find out more about Melissa, you just have to go there and you can click and, and find her. Thanks again, Melissa. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. If you have any questions for us about this episode or would like to suggest topics for future episodes, please use our contact page. You can also email us directly. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast and check the link in the description for the show notes. Thanks for listening.